Holy God, Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we as a congregation bow before you this morning, proclaiming that you are the one true God of all, maker of all. We thank you, God, that you that you are in our, each of our lives on a daily basis, that you care for us through times of trials, that you heal us, that you make provisions for us, and most important, Lord, that you that you are who you say you are, not only in each of our lives, but in the lives of your church. Lord, we give you thanks this day for our military. We remember those, Lord, who have given their lives for us, that we might be here, that we might be free to come to a, a church. The way things are going, Lord, it seems like one day the doors might be closed. It's scary, Lord. We live in scary times with scary people. Our nation, Lord, is adrift. Our nation doesn't really share what you think anymore, Lord. They've gone after their own devices. We ask, dear, dear God, as Christians, under the banner of your holy cross, Lord, that you bind us and keep us faithful to what's in your word, what's being preached by your pastors, Lord, that we stand fast, Lord, because these are very, very trying times. It seems, Lord, with everything that's going on, that you, that you do have this nation in judgment. There's just too many visible signs. And Lord, we ask you, Lord, that when it's time for us to speak the tr truth to those who don't believe or who ignore the biblical truth, Lord, that we would have the guts, Lord, to stand fast and to have faith. Dear God, thank you for being a God who you are, a God of second chances. A God who restores lives. You tell us over and over that when we that when you knock and you open the door and you come in. And dear God, if there's somebody sitting in this congregation this morning, hearing the knock, please, dear Lord, give them the courage to open the door so that their lives will be changed. If so can be saved. And they would be given a real second chance. Dear God, for all that you do for this church, we're grateful. For the staff, for the caretakers, the music direction, Lord, we just thankful that we have all this great night in this church to come to each Sunday. We would ask also the Lord that uh, as our new pastor begins to prepare to come here, that you would be with her that she would enlighten her mind and, and give her forethought as to, as to how she is to guide this congregation. And to David, Lord, we ask this morning that you preach the word to him. And it won't be David, it will be you that we'll be listening to. And we ask, Lord, that you prepare him and Annie also for the realization of retirement, Lord, because he's not going to know what to do with himself. He's so busy all the time, and I'm sure he's going to be looking for something to do. Dear God, thank you once again. There is no other God like you anywhere, no matter what people try to tell us. You are the one, Lord. You are our source of life, our very breath that you give to us on a daily basis. Lord, we ask that you would keep every member in this congregation safe from this virus. Lord, those who are not here this morning, we would ask that you would start bringing them back to this holy sanctuary, Lord, so that uh, they can engage in fellowship with other Christians, but more importantly, thank you and worship you for the things that you have done in their lives. Dear God, be with us. Don't abandon this nation, Lord. Our sins are great, but we know that your mercy 
is you today. Please, by your word, by your people, Lord, turn this nation from its ways. Be with our leaders, Lord, and grant them some spiritual sanity that they know to do the next right thing. Dear God, I don't know what else to say. I think I'm done now. Thank you for who you are, and thank you for all this gave. And now, as Jesus has taught us to pray, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I want to invite Michael to come and invite their wishes to join in. Education. 
she is going to be uh, working here in Sumter where she's finishing up or have finished her school year in Manning Elementary, correct? Yes. Uh, and uh, she got her master's in special education. Uh, so we commend you, Courtney, and thank the Lord for uh, you reaching that goal in life. And uh, we know that the Lord's got great plans for both you and Michael as you go forward and use your education as he would have you to for the greater good of humanity and for the glory of God. So I hope you both continue your pursuit uh, uh, in terms of learning all that you can, knowing that God has uh, great, great plans for you both in the future, without a doubt. So let's thank the Lord for this. women like to recognize the graduating seniors and so we, we have a gift today for them and um, the reason we do this is because they're important. Um, we are, the United Methodist Women are a community of women whose purpose is to know God. Um, that's, our, that's our main thrust and the way we do this is we try to develop a creative supportive fellowship within the church and in a global manner. We expand our concepts of mission from our fellowship group to the global area. All of our funding goes primarily to global missions and we want to spread God's word in this manner. That is what a United Methodist woman does. Seniors, we have faith in you and we pray for you. We hope that you will go out into the world uh, to carry your faith in Jesus, to develop a supportive group that will nurture you, and to be a missionary for God by nurturing others in his name. So my favorite phrase is the joy of the Lord is your strength, and uh, hold on to your joy. I also have a little note from the United Methodist men. You'll like this bit too. <laughs> United Methodist men would also like to recognize our Aldersgate graduates uh, with a gift. Michael. And Courtney. Thank you. They're nice little good sized gift cards. Anyway, the United Methodist men try to promote fellowship among the United Methodist men of Aldersgate and also out into the community. They spread God's word and God's love through doing. These men will be praying for you as well as the United Methodist women. Wherever you go, wherever you are, you're going to be having prayers, uh, many prayers. It's, uh, it's a pretty special thing when in your life you realize just how many people pray and support you. So these men will be praying for you too. They um, spread their love of God by doing and by caring for other people. Their wish is that you will go out into the world and be doers of God's word. Michael and Courtney, we're very proud of you. Thank you for being here. Speaking of prayer, would you join me as we pray for these two graduates? Father God, we give you thanks and praise for uh, Michael and Courtney and their families for uh, enabling them, Lord, to, to reach this point in their life uh, so that they may make the next uh, leg in the journey called life. Bless their futures, O oh Lord, and make them a blessing beyond what they already are, and use them for your glory, O oh God, and for the purpose.
purpose for which you created them. Uh, to spread your love and grace as you have called us all. And keep them close to you and close to their loved ones. And uh, Lord, use them in a mighty, mighty way uh, as, as they endeavor to fulfill your call upon their lives. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. God bless. As the answers come forward, we will worship now the Lord with his eyes.
multiple times the church, who is includes us who are true born again Christians, as his bride. And as I as I know to be true, if we love our spouses like Christ loves us, there would be the statistic that is a marriage is failing the way that they have. And I know what that's like. My mother went through two marriages that failed, including the one with my father. Jesus, through many different ones who are responsible for writing his word, inspired them to say what we need to hear and what we need to heed as it pertains to that relationship between us and the Lord. For we are. We are in a marriage, a covenant if you will, with the Lord. We vow to be his bride and to love him and honor him and serve him in all those ways that we should and he expects us to. Amen? But too many, I'm afraid, don't value that as much as we all should. Hence, we find ourselves going back to the Word again and again and again and learning and relearning what we already should know. And we'll hear from God's Word in just a moment. For those of you that weren't here last week, I preached a sermon on the subject of the all by itself church, the all by itself church, the thrust of that message was taken from the Gospel of Mark chapter four, where Jesus taught the parable concerning the growing of the kingdom. And prior to that, he taught the parable of the growing, excuse me, the parable of sowing the seed, the seed of the gospel. We are the sowers. He is the grower. As you recall my making mention of last week. In fact, there were several, several biblical principles that I focused or emphasized in the message that are directly related to the process of sowing and, or planting the seeds of the gospel. As you may recall, those of you that were present, we first must have seeds sown. You can't have a garden without seeds, can you? You can't have a kingdom without the seeds of the gospel. And who supplies those seeds? Not us. But God, God, another principle by which we need to live is the fact that we grow what we sow. We grow what we sow. You can't plant a watermelon seed and expect to get squashed, can you? It just doesn't happen that way. And you can't sow worldly seeds and expect to get holy results. you got to sow again the right seeds in order to have the right harvest or crop. And in that process too, as I mentioned, you've got to have patience because things don't grow on our time frame when it comes to the kingdom of God and the church. God says, I will grow my church. And he does not work on a 24-hour schedule. He works in eternity. And he again is the 
one that we are solely dependent upon when it comes to growing as far as our individual lives and our lives together as the church. Well, I want to take that that thought, that message to a, a, another place, if you will, and talk today about growth factors. Growth factors that account for most of the success, or all the success, I might say, of the church and her efforts to fulfill the great commandment, which is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. There are several growth factors, and I'll get into them as the next two Sundays unfold, including, or, or in addition to this Sunday. But I want to talk about the number one growth factor when it comes to you and I and the church fulfilling her mission and ministry of making disciples. That growth factor is loving relationships. Loving relationships. My hope and prayer for this sermon is that all of us will grasp a greater understanding and a deeper appreciation for this particular growth factor or quality characteristic of any church that is growing so that we can further implement this growth factor. We can further capitalize on such here at Aldersgate. And in so doing, be able to witness growth quantitatively and qualitatively. Quantitatively and qualitatively. So, I invite you now to listen carefully to Jim as he reads our scripture text from Colossians chapter 3. Verses 12 through 17. Would you please stand as you're able in reverence to the word? Our New Testament reading is from Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. This is the Word of God, the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Your Word, Your Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. Therefore, may it continue. May it continue to shine into our hearts just now and always as we give our undivided attention to the eternal truths and, and everlasting impressions that it seeks to give and reveal. We pray this in the precious and most powerful name of Jesus and all God's people say. 
Amen. Please be seated. A love letter read as follows. Dear Jimmy, no words could ever express the great happiness, or excuse me, the great unhappiness, unhappiness I felt since breaking our engagement. Please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart. So please forgive me. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yours forever. Susan. P.S. And congratulations on winning the lottery. What motivates your love and mine for God and for one another? That's the question I want us to consider as we look further into Paul's letter to the church in Colossians. And that church growth factor that accounts for, as I said, most and the greatest successes of the church and by which all other growth factors derive. That being loving relationships. As soon as you and I became a Christian, at that very moment, certain obligations were placed on us. As Paul reminds us in his epistle, four times in a different translation than what Jim read, he uses the word, you must, you must, you must, you must. As God's elect or chosen ones, he says, we have a legal and moral duty, a binding contract or covenant, if you will, to fulfill. I like what the expositors, excuse me, commentary has to say about this moral and legal contract or covenant. It says, Quote, the essence of this Christian obligation has to do with a radical, a radical life-changing experience in which we have to put off, put off the old self with its practices or habits and have to put on or has to put on the new self. The metaphor that Paul uses is one of clothing, of clothing. Now, he's not talking about this type of clothing. He's talking about spiritual clothing, if you will. The old self, according to God's word and Paul's understanding, is like a dirty worn out garment that is stripped, stripped from the body and thrown away never to be worn again. Whereas the new self he refers to is like a brand new suit of clothing that one puts on and wears and that has the Christian puts on this new suit, suit, he or she is clothing him or herself with the garments that give witness to this radical life-changing experience. In other words, there's an exchange, a very important exchange taking place between the old self 
and that of the new. The new that Paul speaks of in his other letter to the Corinthians, whereby he said, Behold, all things, all things pass away, behold, all things become new in the Christian's life. It's important to note in this same passage that Paul's appeal to the church there in Colossians is based upon this threefold fact. Christians are chosen by God. And they are set apart or made holy by God. And most importantly, they are loved by God. So we are a chosen people, we are a holy people, and we are a loved people. So says God's Word. Yes, we are favored as well as privileged, but not without certain obligations and expectations. Every one of us who wishes to be adopted into the family of God, as I've already stated in God's word more so, we must develop or have developed in us a particular, a particular spiritual DNA that directly link, links us to our Heavenly Father which is the blood of Jesus Christ. We get a transfusion, if you will, where that tainted blood, that sinful blood, is replaced by the blood of Christ. That holy and sanctified, life-giving blood that he shed for you and me and all who seek to be his followers. And as we have that spiritual DNA transfused in us, we then must put on and clothe ourselves with, as Paul says, compassion or tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We must, he says, make allowance for each other's faults. <coughs> And we must forgive those who offend us. As we ourselves have been forgiven. I can't speak for you. I can speak for me. I've been forgiven for a lot of stuff. It's not, not very, very God honoring. In fact, it wasn't at all. And if you and I look at our lives and, and recognize that we're not perfect, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yet, God chose us and loved us while we were yet sinners. So much so that he sent his only begotten son Jesus to die so that we could be set free. We could have our, our past forgiven and made new. And if we take that in the way that it should be, then forgiving one another won't be near as long. In fact, it shouldn't be difficult at all for any of us, but we can't do that on our own. 
in our own strength, in my opinion. No, the, the, the sinful nature we were born with wants to get even. We want that person to hurt as much as they hurt us. And God says, that's not the way my children are to act or behave. We must make allowance for each other's faults. We must forgive those who offend us, and they will. But above all, he says, but above all, we must love everyone. And he's specifically speaking to the church. Although that includes the world or all of humanity, but we, we're called first to love one another within the body of Christ. I like what D.L. Moody once said about that character, that growth factor. He said, show me a church where there is love and I will show you a church that is a power in the community. You know, I hear it and have heard it throughout my tenure here, which will soon be five years, that Alders Gate is a loving church. And I couldn't be proud as your pastor for another three weeks. Because that's where it's at. That's what it's all about. It's about love. And the particular love that Paul speaks of is the particular love that he refers to in his letter to the Corinthians chapter 13. It's love that is patient. It is love that is kind. It is love that does no wrong. And keep, or excuse me, does not keep any records of wrong. It's the love that believes all things and bears all things. And bears all things. Why is any church a power in the community where there is love? It's because Love is what binds us together as a community of faith. Anything else won't ever make that be. Can't ever make us one as we're called to be. And love always has a heart of compassion, a forgiveness like God, a peace that cannot war with others. And that, I believe, is the kind of church that we all want to be a part of, a church that gives witness to that same kind of agape love or unconditional love. I believe this with all my heart. The most powerful force in the universe, bar none, is love. Is love. And if we will make the most of every opportunity to share and to celebrate God's love for us as individuals, and as a corporate body, this world will take notice. And I am so bold to believe that with the Lord's help and His Spirit living in you and me, we can help 
transform this world. And oh, how desperately the world needs love. And I know what that's like. Because I was that person that desperately needed love. Some years ago, when I thought all was lost and hopeless, God threw that lifeline out to me. And had he not, I would not be where I am today and as blessed as I am today. Serving alongside of some of the finest people I've ever had the privilege and the honor of pastoring and being part of as a member of this local church all this day. Thank you. Thank you for giving witness to God by showing forth the love that you have and do for one another as well as those outside of these four walls. You are to be committed, but you're also to be encouraged to continue loving one another. By this, Jesus himself said, they will know that you are my disciples if you want to have love for one another. St. Augustine is credited of saying this, in essentials unity, in non-essentials unity, excuse me, liberty, but in all things, charity alone. Three things are mentioned in God's Word that are eternal faith, hope, and what? Love. Love. But the greatest of those three is love. love. Therefore, the most enduring legacy that any of us can leave on earth is not how well we treat our wealth or our achievement of certain things but rather how successful, how successful our relationships are with others, including those within the community of faith, and how quick we are to express our love for God by expressing our love for God. Let's pray. Almighty God, it is with thankful hearts that we turn again toward heaven through the means of grace called prayer, thanking you first and foremost for love that is never ending, for love that shows compassion, kindness, patience, gentleness, long suffering, and a faithfulness like none other. Oh God, continue to cultivate that same love in our hearts as we endeavor to fulfill your call and your commission to go and make disciples of Jesus Christ. I pray for each individual who is present now 
you will bless him and her. In all the ways we need you to. To make us more like Christ. In the way that we love others. So that in the end, oh God, you will welcome us into your kingdom above. With open arms and a proud heart. Saying those words we all long to hear. hear well done, thy good and faithful servant. This we pray in the holy and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Would you please stand for our closing hymn, Blessed Be the Tide of Life. Thank you.